Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. We are having a speech today with James Blair, with your speech on REST APIs. So could you give him a warm welcome? Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm here to uh, talk to you about console apps and why I'm so excited about them as well as REST APIs. Um, and as was recently pointed out to me, they are not the same thing. So uh, we'll, we'll be covering both of them in this talk. Um, so uh, I'm going to do that by talking to you a little bit about a program that I wrote recently called Gertie. And to give you a little bit of background on that, uh, I work for a Silicon Valley startup um, <laughs> running the developer infrastructure for the OpenStack project. And as part of that developer workflow, um, as you can see, it's, it's illustrated here. And it's exceedingly simple because I drew it that way. And also in the middle of the screen, because I drew it that way, is a tool called Garrett. And uh, Garrett is a standalone code review tool written by Google for the Android Open Source Project. And uh, it looks like this. This is a screenshot of Garrett. Um, this is not actually a screenshot of Garrett, since Garrett is a web application. And I don't know if you've figured out what's going on here, but this is, this is, this is decidedly uh, a text-based presentation. Um, but if you've ever used Garrett, you, you would probably agree that this is pretty much what it looked like, especially if you used it when we first started using it. Um, we honestly, we, we, we kind of had to, to really try to love it. Um, and, and Garrett's own authors admitted that UI design wasn't really their cup of tea. They were, they were more back-end folks. So um, we, we, uh, we made some changes. Um, so this is, this is what Garrett looks like now. Um, these were actually so well received that if you install any Garrett, um, uh, they pretty much all look like this. We, 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 we added the OpenStack colors, uh, and, and they said, wow, those are great colors. We'll use them. Um, <laughs> so we were able to, to upstream some, you know, some somewhat minor changes, some aesthetic changes, things like that. Um, but we were never really able to... Uh, to, to upstream some of the larger changes that I wanted to make, uh, changes around workflow and how developers actually use it. Uh, and, but then Garrett continued to evolve, and uh, they produced uh, this, this REST API. Uh, and it turns out it was rather fully featured. I, I, I took a look at it and, and realized that almost everything that you could do in the Garrett web interface, you could, you could do with their, uh, their REST API. And... Um, and so I thought, well, maybe I'd have a chance to address some of these longer-term, uh, larger concerns uh, in Garrett without having to you know, try to convince them to change their application in ways that they weren't prepared to. Um, so I, I had sort of four big reasons that I, I started working on, on Gertie. And, and one is, is around the workflow. Um, I'm one of the more active reviewers in the OpenStack project. Um, bizarrely, I don't actually review any OpenStack code, but uh, fortunately that doesn't matter. Um, and uh, I, I, I always wanted a workflow that was a little more akin to email. Um, I, I really like email. This is a screenshot of my email client. This is actually a screenshot of my email client, because my email client is in Emacs and it's all text modey. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that sort of workflow that, uh, like the zero inbox uh, workflow where, where um, you know, you're, you've, you've got your messages going into, into an inbox and you try to dispose of them all in one way or another, whether that's answering them, deleting them, something like that. You know, that's, that's a workflow, a way of surfacing the, the, the emails that you need to read. And that's what I wanted to get out of Garrett, is these are changes that I haven't reviewed yet, I need to do something with them. Review them, ignore them, but do something. Uh, and, and so I, I wanted to build that kind of workflow, and it was rather hard to do that uh, with Garrett's uh, standard interface. Um, and uh, the, you know the reason the reason why I keep comparing this to, to email and also news groups I should say my my email reader is also a news reader so I kind of think they're the same thing uh, and I don't I don't understand when people talk about them differently but um, 
but uh, it is you know we, we have all of these tools for dealing with uh, with massive amounts of incoming uh, data um, tasks that need to be done things like that um, there's a lot of tooling and processes around that with mail and news it's very mature and 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 I just wanted to be able to apply that kind of thinking to code review as well um, Another reason that we uh, that, that I thought that this was important to write is um, some of us, for some reason, end up spending a lot of time traveling around talking at conferences or something. Um, and so, if yeah, well, so yeah, if 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 if, if this is if this is where you live, or even better, if this is where you live, then. <laughs> I, I have not achieved your level yet, Bradley. I'm sorry. So, uh, the, if if you're traveling around all the time, then uh, then then Gertie is for you. Um, I, I wanted I wanted to be able to to have a system that uh, that we could do code reviews offline. We can we can write code online. We can write ter sorry offline. We can write terrible code sitting on a plane. And I don't know. Do. Yeah, I usually do. And and land and push it up and make all of our friends review it. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, they some, they get out of reviewing code because they can't do it. They're on a plane. So I've, I I wanted to remove that excuse. Uh, I mean, I wanted to allow everyone to be able to participate equally in all of the processes. Uh, and, and, and so I, I wanted to make sure this thing worked uh, offline as well as online. So it turns out that being on an airplane and um, being on a slow part of the internet are, are, are really just two, two versions of the same thing. One, one's an extreme, the other one's elsewhere on the continuum. So. Uh, it's just different amounts of latency, right? So here's a, a schematic map of uh, the the internet uh, submarine cables, and you know if you if you happen to have a server located in the top left of that, and you're located in I don't know say the bottom right, um, <laughs> then it turns out that actually being able to reduce that that latency in some way is very important. And uh, and to my delight, some of the earliest contributions to 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 Gertie's um, uh, efficiency, as far as that goes, uh, came uh, right from here. So, in fact, right there. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so, when to, to address both of these um, uh, issues, I what I did was I, I chose. I could have written an application that directly used uh, the REST APIs in Garrett. Uh, I could have, you know, synchros synchronously had it. Um, uh, post reviews or whatever, but instead what I chose to do is to have a local database of all of the changes and then a background process that keeps it in sync. And so if you're online, that's very quick. You can, you can post a review, it's going to immediately send it up, and if it realizes that it's offline, then it just saves it to its database and, uh, and, and tries to catch up the next time. Um, so there's a there's a local SQLite database to accomplish that for for all of the change metadata, um, but for the changes themselves, I had the choice of uh, I could of course ask Garrett for a whole bunch of diffs and uh, put them in like um, text columns in the database or something like that, but it turns out Git is already a distributed uh, system. Uh, yeah, and and so uh, I, I realized that what I could do is is just point Gertie at the the Git repos that you would normally use for development anyway, um, and have it sort of behind the scenes without changing your your working uh, your working tree or anything. Uh, have it um, have it download those changes into your Git repositories, uh, and it can then uh, generate its own diffs on the fly for whatever combination of patch sets uh, that, that you wanted to have it do. Um, as, a, as a side effect, that meant that, that suddenly we actually get an opportunity to do things in Gertie that we would never be able to do in Garrett, such as bind a keystroke to check out this change into my repo, or cherry pick this change onto the top of the current branch, or something like that. Because while it's great to, to review code um, you know, online and leave comments, that's an important part of it, occasionally you want to check something out and, and grep to make sure that somebody didn't miss something or uh, actually run the change, assuming that they you know, didn't put a rootkit in it or something. Um, 
So, uh, so, so just the the ability to you know uh, tell tell Gertie to check this thing out locally and do something with it uh, is is something that uh, that I think is really neat that we would not have been able to uh, to do in the in the web application. Um, so that's that's. Those are all good reasons, I think, to, to write an application like this in the first place, but why did I make it a console application? Um, so I think you know, code review is, is text, uh, or sorry, code is text. And uh, over the past 30 years, we've been developing some, some really fabulous tools for dealing with text, uh, including the terminal. Uh, and, and I think that if you're dealing with that kind of information, you should use the best tools for the job. Um, so. Uh, when I was uh, a wee little lad, uh, a company called Digital Equipment Corporation, which should never ever be confused with the company that I work for currently, um, <laughs> released something called the VT100, uh, and to this day, it is the it is the terminal that terminal emulators are emulating. And uh, but fortunately, things have come along a little bit since then. Uh, it's it's not the same as it was 30 years ago. Uh, we have, of course, mouse support uh, and um, colors. In fact, quite a lot of colors. Uh, I didn't honestly. I didn't even realize this when I first started working on this. 256 color terminals are pretty common now. Full RGB terminals exist as well. And frankly, I didn't even realize that until I started writing the program to display these slides. Um, <laughs> So um, there, in fact, terminals are so sophisticated now. Uh, you can, you can. Uh, it's perfectly appropriate, I think, uh, to use them to show off your holiday snapshots. So, uh, <laughs> here we are above Queenstown. Uh, here's the the Meraki boulders, uh, Lake Wakatipu. Uh, the Quora River. I mean, look at that color, right? It, that's the color of it, right? Uh, the Root Burn Track, which is amazing. Uh, Cathedral Cove. And another, uh, uh, this is up here on the North Island, of course. Uh, this is another shot of Cathedral Cove. I'm there on the left. Uh, and uh, Langahangi on Waitangi Day. And Bethel's Beach, which is uh, not too far from here. And I highly recommend it, though it's not generally that warm. Um, so clearly this has gotten off track a bit. So <laughs> let's talk about something that's actually in the title of the talk for a bit. Uh, REST APIs. So uh, an API, um, th this is what Wikipedia has to say about it. Um, I think we all think we know what an API is. It's some stuff that helps you do some stuff, which is <laughs> sort of the problem with it. It's a little vague. It's, it's, maybe it's a library, maybe it's a protocol. Maybe it helps you inter interface with a, a running process, a data storage system, a physical device. It's some stuff that helps you do some stuff. Um, maybe we can get a little clearer with what REST is. Uh, fortunately, REST was defined in a, uh, somebody's uh, whoop, uh, a dissertation from a guy named Roy Fielding. And, uh, and so he says that you need these things in order to have a, a RESTful application. Uh, you, you need to have a, a client-server relationship um, so that they can be developed independently. That's clearly germane to what we're talking about here. Um, stateless, so you should not have client context stored on the, on the server uh, and used between requests, which doesn't mean you can't have any state whatsoever. Uh, it's okay to, uh, to, to maybe uh, store it in a database and have the client refer to that state or something like that. Um, there, there are ways around issues there. Uh, cacheable and layered system, those, those both kind of relate to the idea that um, let's say you're building the World Wide Web, you should expect to have uh, proxies and other inter intermediary systems between your client and your server, and they should be able to, to fit into this thing and understand enough about what's going on to, to do their job as far as caching and, and whatnot goes. Um, code on demand is an optional requirement of the REST API. Uh, basically, as far as I can tell, that's there to sort of account for JavaScript. Uh, it's the, the idea is that you, your server can give code to the client that it can run. Um, this is not required for a REST API or a REST, uh, an application to be RESTful, um, but, uh, but it, it can be there if, 
if the system doesn't support it, it should uh, gracefully uh, fall back to, to not needing it. And then um, things should have a uniform interface, which gets its own slide. Um, so that in, in, in includes uh, identification of resources. So basically, everything uh, should, should be uniquely identified in some way. Typically, this is through a URI. Um, uh, the manipulation of those resources uh, should be changed by uh, changing their representation. So, so you know, if you fetch a resource and you change something about it and you put it back, that's how you manipulate um, something described by a REST API. Self-descriptive messages. Um, again, just sort of falling back on the idea of the World Wide Web. This basically means that things should have MIME headers so that uh, the, the client knows what to do with whatever kind of response it gets. Um, and then there's this thing called hypermedia as the engine of application state. Which basically means that uh, all of the state transitions uh, should be described through hypermedia, which doesn't necessarily mean hypertext or HTML or, or something like that. But, but it just means it, it's the idea that, say, you had um, a cloud API that uh, describes a server or something. It should tell you all of the things that you can do to that server um, using hyper references to, to, to other uh, locations. Um, that the idea there is that clients should really only need to be able to understand uh, understand the structure, and then they can be sort of dynamically extended to uh, uh, to, to to perform new actions. Um, so, if you've been following along, you might be thinking about the REST APIs that you've seen, and um, which of these things I've talked about they don't have, and. Um, honestly, I put this one at the top of the list. This seems extremely rare to me. And um, if you, hmm? yeah, if you if you if you look at the whole list, um, so here's here's what you need to be a REST API, which curiously has one X missing from its because it's an optional requirement, right? Uh, and and then sort of going back to say you want to write an application like Gertie um, over on the right. That's what you need to, to make a third-party client. You, you need a client server. You need to be able to identify resources. Everything else that you can get on that list is helpful. Uh, and, and so honestly, if you're writing a REST API, you should try to make it as much of a REST API as possible. It's a good idea, and it's going to help people uh, using your API. Um, but you know, from my perspective, this is sort of the bare minimum that you, that you need. And in fact, there's one thing that you don't need, uh, code on demand. If, if Garrett required like, running JavaScript in order to do something, I would not have been able to write Gertie. So that's, that's a strange thing. So enough about that except to say that if, uh, if you want to get some beer and talk about whether there ever has been or ever will be a RESTful application <laughs> other than the World Wide Web itself, uh, I'd be happy to, to engage in that conversation with you. Um, so going back to what an API is, one of the things that uh, the Cal said that an API uh, could be is uh, a protocol. And this is what Wikipedia has to say about protocols. Um, and when you think about it, actually a lot of REST APIs are very little bit more than just a thin layer on top of a communications protocol, um, which is great. Um, there have been a lot of good protocols uh, throughout history. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight a couple that I really like. Uh, this one is getting, being, being picked on a lot lately, uh, but I, I really like it anyway. Uh, it's IMAP. Um, you can type text into it. You can you know, tell that to it or use OpenSSL as client or, or whatever. Um, it's got tagged responses, so you can do asynchronous things, and it'll tell you which thing you're responding to. Um, uh, and it's got lots of annoying parentheses, which is unfortunate. But you know, it's it's not perfect, but it's 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 interesting. Uh, SMTP, I kind of like this too. It's obviously very successful. Uh, it may not be as successful at what we want it to do uh, as we would like, but but it is. Um, and again, I mean, this is something you can you can tell it to the port, and you can type help, and it'll tell you what to do. Though, though I'm told that can occasionally be problematic. Um, but and then we, let's look at HTTP and JSON APIs, right? This is sort of what, what people are doing now for, for protocols, right? Um, it's, it's still almost as easy to use. You can't tell that to the port and type nice, neat commands. But hey, well, OK, yes, you can. You can. It's really, really. It's a lot of typing. It's a lot of typing. 
but but you can you can you can use these curl commands, which make it a little nicer uh, until you're starting to tell curl like which extra headers and to attach the binary data and stuff like that. It gets a little squirrely. It's just it's not quite as easy to use, but it's not it's not bad. But what it what it lacks in sort of online debugability, it makes up for in parsability because JSON is pretty awesome. And and to be honest, if IMAP returned JSON blobs or something, that would be swell. Like that would be way better than parsing all those prints. But we're, we're getting to an interesting place, um, though, with things like WebSockets. Uh, a, a lot of the reasoning for creating these, uh, these APIs in the, you know, using HTTP the way that, that they have been so far is, is, has to do with the way web requests were made from, from client applications. But now that uh, we have things like WebSockets and uh, a lot more uh, capabilities in, in JavaScript applications, I think we can be getting to a point where uh, instead of making HTTP requests and getting JSON blobs back all the time, we could actually be streaming interesting data back and forth on WebSockets, probably still in JSON. But you know, imagine that instead of doing GET or POST requests all the time, you're actually just sending little commands to a server. It sends a JSON blob back. This is, uh, and, you know, you could you could do that inside of a JavaScript application. You could do that uh, with a you know a, a client that isn't related to uh, a web browser at all. Um, so I think I think we're actually getting to an interesting place as far as that goes. Um, toolkits. So right, we're talking about console applications. So when I was looking at, at how to write GERTY, um, I, I I like writing Python. So I looked at uh, a couple of different toolkits that I could use in Python. There's Newt, which is, um, it is venerable, right? It's been around for quite a while. It's the it's a little thing when you install Red Hat, it pops up the little dialogues that, uh, that ask you questions. Um, there's apparently a Python library called Snack to help make that easier. Uh, I honestly don't know how well this is maintained at this point, so, so beware of that. Uh, there's, a, there's a neat thing called InPyScreen, which uh, I might have even used if I'd uh, found it when I first started working on, on Gertie, but it's, it's actually very new. And um, it's a really great toolkit for, uh, I want to present a form to a user and have them enter in some data and then retrieve that data from it. Um, so if, if that's sort of what you're looking for in, in the console application that you're writing, uh, you might want to check that out. Uh, there's something called Curtsies, which is uh, far simpler than that, actually. It, it basically aims to be a, a nice way of dealing with, uh, dealing with a terminal, but maybe not focused on form inputs or complicated applications or things like that. Uh, what I ended up using is uh, a system called Irwid, which um, is more like a... Uh, an application framework. So if you're if you're used to writing a GTK or a Qt application or so, <coughs> excuse me, something like that, uh, you might find Erwid somewhat familiar. Uh, I did at first, and um, so it's really designed for this sort of long-term event loop kind of application where it's like I you build things out of widgets, you display them, you get some input, then you you do something else. Um, so this is uh, this is sort of the hello world application in in Irwid. Um, the interesting bit is actually at the bottom, and uh, it, it you create a uh, a text widget with some text in it. You put it in some kind of a container, and you tell the main loop to display that container, and uh, and then that function at the top gets past uh, keystrokes. And so if you hit Q, it exits. If you hit anything else, then uh, then it just changes the text in your in your text widget to. To, to be something else. And um, so with that introduction, I'm going to show you a quick little demo of uh, Gertie. And that's it. There we go. Um, so sorry, this is the, the type is a little bit smaller on this, but I'm going to squeeze some stuff in, in later screens. So uh, try to bear with me. The words aren't important. Um, so so you know when you, when you start out with with Gertie, it's got this list of projects that you're subscribed to, right? So thinking about email again, um, and you can it, it tells you how many uh, how many open changes there are for every project and how many unreviewed changes there are. Um, as you can see, I've I've not been doing very well on reviews here lately. I've apparently been flying around or something and writing this talk. Um, but uh, but you can see, you know, this is this is equivalent to these are how many messages you have in this folder or whatever. And and the terrifying thing about Gertie is it tells you actually how far behind you are. Um, 
So if you, if you click on that, it shows you all of the open reviews. And uh, this is something that I was uh, working on right before I left, and not many people have seen it yet. But look, threading, like email, right? So, uh, <laughs> so you can see all of the, all of the uh, outstanding changes that you have to review for, for this project. Um, and you can click on one of those, and it brings up a change screen, which is, in spirit, not that different from uh, the, the, the screenshot of Garrett earlier. But uh, notably, this is, this is text, and that's, uh, that's on the web. Um, so it, it shows you the information about the change. Uh, it's, it's got a table of the, the, the reviews, so sorry, information about change, uh, people who've reviewed it, um, the, the commit message, uh, all of the results from our extensive test system. Um, and down here we've got uh, comments that people have left on the change in general. Um, Right here, it's got the uh, uh, the files that have changed. There's only one. I, I maybe didn't pick the best thing to show you. Um, and uh, with a key, you can have it show you uh, a, a diff between the two. Um, so here's the the old and new side, and, uh, and you know you can hit enter and and leave comments, etc. Um, and uh, Let's see what else. So there's, uh, you can have um, pop up, whoa, oops, sorry, pop up dialogues. Uh, and uh, the mouse works, right? So if I click on the diff button, it'll go back there. Um, so basically, all, all the modern conveniences. Uh, these, are, these are also uh, links, actually. So if I, if I go over here, it's, these colors aren't great. Um, but if I click on any of these, it'll open a web browser uh, to, to that, which obviously doesn't work so well on the plane, but there's only so much data that you want to download. Um, so, so anyway, that's, that's sort of that's what GERTY looks like, and that's you know, briefly what uh, um, the, the sorts of things that you can do with, with IRWID. Um, so going back to the, the slides. Oh, whoops, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so... If you think about the, the, the screen structure I just showed you, um, there's, uh, you can imagine building that up out of boxes, right? Every, every system has a box model, whether it's CSS or tech or Erwid or GTK or whatever. Everybody has a box model. The only problem is that everybody's box model is completely different. And uh, everything that you learn about how to work with one doesn't translate to any of the others. And Erwid is no exception. Um, but uh, uh, the pile is your is your typical vertical container. Uh, the columns are your sort of horizontal container. Uh, the list box is your scrollable vertical container. Uh, there is no scrollable horizontal container because I guess people don't want to do that in terminals. Uh, seems reasonable to me, um, and and so forth. So that's sort of how you 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 build things up out of uh, uh, out of out of boxes. Um, but, but again, the behavior of those seems straightforward at first, but when you get into the, the nitty gritty, it, it turns out that, that you're probably going to have to learn some things about the specific behavior of some of these widgets in, in Erwid. Um, but fortunately, you can, uh, if, if anything's not to your liking, it's actually pretty easy to change. So uh, in writing Gertie, I ended up subclassing a lot of the widgets in Erwid. So for instance, if I wanted a button that did not expand to fill the width of its container. Uh, this is all you have to do to do that. So it's, it's just a button that, uh, that reports its, its dimensions differently when asked. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to, to do that sort of thing. Um, there's one more consideration that I, I think is important when you're working on a console application. And that's uh, visual design. So if you if you think about uh, web design right now, we're we're kind of coming into this phase where there's lots of boxes and solid colors. Like if you, if you think about uh, the material design guidelines from from uh, Google and what those look like, um, that's sort of that's sort of what things are are looking at right now. In, in the past, there's been um, you know, boxes with lines around things. That's obviously a, a perennial favorite in desktop applications. Um, these, these things sort of change over time. They seem to not change very often in console applications, which is nice and refreshing. Uh, mostly our, our tools for, for sort of creating um, a visual layout to, to sort of you know, indicate the, the, the relationship of information to each other, they're, they're kind of limited to color and space, which is 
Nice. It's part of actually why I, I enjoy using uh, console applications. So if you look at this, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, there's no, there's no graphic structure here. There are no lines or anything to draw your attention or separate different areas of the screen. Um, what I'm doing there is I'm changing color and, and using positioning to indicate that, right? So there's clearly a box of information at the top with, you know, key value pairs. There's a, there's a table underneath that. Um, there's a, a list of some files, there, there are buttons, there's uh, comments from people, and, and all of that's communicated um, uh, via color and space. And as you, you know, once you use this a couple of times, you, you pick up on what the patterns are and how to, to narrow in on, on what you're looking for fairly quickly. If you look at the same thing without any color, it's almost, uh, it, it, it's rather difficult to navigate. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that I've spent a, deal, a good deal of time on in Gertie is, is working on those color and space relationships, and, uh, and it's, it's fortunately quite enjoyable. So uh, to sort of summarize, uh, console apps are cool. Uh, they're fast, efficient, customizable, and modern. And uh, this is, uh, that's a link where you can find Gertie, and that's uh, a link to, to the Irwid project, where uh, it actually has great documentation, by the way. Um, so uh, you can find all of that there. And uh, with that, uh, that's all I have. Oh, and there are some questions. What are your slides written in? They are written in a program called Presenti. <laughs> Which you can also find on PyPy. Uh, it's, um, uh, you write the, the text in restructured text. It supports cross fades, pans, cut transitions. Uh, uh, you, you, it'll shell out to Figlid and Calse for you. If, if you use dot dot image colon, uh, which incidentally, if you're using a restructured text system to, to do um, web-based slides, uh, often those use the, the image um, uh, command in restructured text to, to include an image. If you do the same thing in Presenti, it'll shell out to um, uh, JPEG to A to, to do the ASCII art conversion for you. Um. Any other questions? Yeah. So, so you're obviously an Emacs user because you had good news on a slide. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you investigated writing it as Emacs because it seems like Emacs is the place where console people have gone to hide mostly. <laughs> um, certainly I have. Uh, oh, or via. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, half, half, roughly 50% of the console people have gone to hide in Emacs. And I, as an Emacs user, did you think about doing this? It was just because we all hate Emacs Lisp, even those who love Emacs, or, or was there another reason? Um, it, it, this is more of a personal reason. You know, I, 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 I actually would have loved to spend uh, the time to do it in Emacs Lisp because I enjoy writing in Lisp, but I'm not good enough or proficient enough at it to do all of the things that I uh, knew that I would needed to do with Gertie. Uh, not only the network stuff, but um, you know the local data storage uh, things, uh, shelling out to to, to get um, all of. There's a lot there, and uh, uh, and I wanted to stop using the web application as soon as possible. <laughs> Hey, uh, I guess one of the really great things about the command line is the key bindings as well. Is it mm -hmm. is that supported in Urbit, or is it hard to uh, you know implement? Uh, yeah, so so um, I I made customizable key bindings in in Urbit. It's pretty it, in Urbit itself. It's pretty easy to do. You you just um, you you supply a function, and uh, whenever a key is hit, it gets passed into that function, right? Uh, and then what you do with that is up to you. So right now what I have is I just have a table of key bindings to commands uh, that you can change in the, in the Gertie config file. Um, and, uh, and so you can make your own customizable key bindings for that. I, I need to make it a little more sophisticated so that you can have two level things so that you can hit control X, control something, or colon something, uh, whatever your preference may be. Uh, uh, and actually, it, it, might be, it might be good to do that in some sort of generic way that other Urbid apps uh, can use. So. 
Hey, uh, I actually had two questions. The first was, um, at the beginning of your slides, you mentioned being able to work offline, working from airplanes and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I know, barring the conversations we were having earlier about having Wi-Fi on flights, is there any capability of using this to, have, to do some things you might not be able to do with, uh, with just the Garrett web interface? And the second one is, I know we all like uh, you know, black background on white text, but is there also a light option? There, there, there is a, a light option. I think it's dash L or dash dash light or something. I have no idea. I wrote it, but I never used it. Um, uh, and Presenti has that too, by the way. Um, uh, as for the first question, um, there, yeah, it's it's. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things that we've done in in Gertie that you can't use in, do in the in the regular web application. Um, just as as far as the the things related to offline use. Um, uh, despite being online, there's the latency issue, right? That you're not waiting for the the round trip HTTP traffic or or whatever. Um, and because because the if you go back to like user interface guidelines, uh, 200 milliseconds is about how long uh, it 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 uh, if you press a button and something doesn't happen within 200 milliseconds, it starts to feel like you didn't actually press the button. Um, so uh, having and, and occasionally web apps can't actually accommodate that because of all the overhead of, of doing that that back and forth, especially depending on where you are. So so what we have is an application that's always responsive, uh, regardless of what the the network is like. Uh, and so it's actually it feels a lot better as a user because um, you know if I'm if I'm reviewing changes all day, the the the. You know the amount of time that I spend waiting for the web app to to do something, and, and you know, I, I, and I'd, I'd work around that by doing things like opening a lot of tabs. Like here's a list of changes. Okay, open them all in a tab so that they're all loading in the background, which is which is kind of silly. Um, so so you know, here's here's an application that's always responsive, or at least if it's not responsive, it's because I can't write SQL queries. Um, when you were thinking about the things that you wanted to accomplish within the console client, mm -hmm. um, was there anything that you Significantly change from your original idea. Um, I think all of the all of the big things were were in there. Just the usual sort of um, wow. This this thing ended up being a lot harder than I thought it should be. The, the hard things the hard things ended up being easy, and the easy things ended up being hard. Um, like the the fact that that all of the the diffs um, they they show up as one one continuous stream, right? So all of the different files. Uh, just show up one after another in the diff screen, uh, which has been like the most requested feature from from the Garrett web interface forever, uh, and it and it doesn't have that. So apparently that's hard to do in the web interface, but uh, it would have been hard to do in Gritty, and that ended up being easy uh, the the way that I did it. So um, yeah, but just just that sort of thing, and and you know the occasional fighting with. I think that if I put these two widgets into a container, they should behave this way, but it turns out that they don't, and you have to go. Debug that sort of thing. So, so I don't think I had to make any major con uh, um, uh, any major concessions on on the big features. How do you deal with conflicts after being offline for a long period of time? Um, log them to an error log that nobody reads, and hope it works out. Uh, so, so most of this is is append only, actually. So, so it works out uh, pretty nice, right? Uh, it. Um, you can never delete your comments uh, in Garrett at all. Uh, so generally, all you're doing is you're you're leaving comments on on things, and you're leaving more comments uh, in addition to that. And all of the comments are directed toward a specific patch set. So if people upload new revisions of it, uh, ev even if that happens while you're offline, uh, your comments are going to go to the patch set that you actually reviewed. So that works out. The only thing that that might substantially change uh, is uh, is if um, uh, if you if you leave a vote on a certain patch set and it's been updated, then your vote won't be counted anymore because it's not relevant. So so the good thing about that is that you're you're never going to approve a change while you're offline and then accidentally have it approve something other than what you really approved, right? Because it that's that's an invalid condition. It's just it's you, you'll you'll have you'll you'll it'll end up that you have you will have left a comment on an old patch set. And you'll just have to go back and look at the new patch set again once it's there. Um, there, there are some things that we might want to do. Uh, we, we've had folks say um, that if I leave 
a positive review uh, on a change and somebody else leaves a negative review um, while I wasn't looking, I would like to find out about that because um, maybe they're pointing out uh, something that I missed and I'm going to look stupid. Um, so, uh, there, but, but those are actually conditions that'll be easy to detect and we could, uh, once we stop doing things like logging important information in a log that nobody reads uh, and instead surfacing that up to the, the user interface uh, on the screen, uh, that'll actually be pretty easy to do. Oh, very good. Well, that's all we have time for here at the moment, but could you please welcome, oh, before that, please take this oh. as a thank you from everyone on the team thank at you. LCA. And please thank James for his speak and his uh, lovely family snaps. <laughs> <laughs>